Right, thanks very much, Simon. Um, yeah, my name is Adam Krimble. I am going to talk about social media from the perspective of a marketer um, and how that can teach academics uh, a thing or two. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about how the heritage sector has been using social media. Um, so I'm going to project what they have told me. I did some interviews with them, so I'm going to project their knowledge rather than pretend that I'm necessarily the expert here. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that I am not the marketer. Um, but I do think that these people have a thing or two to teach us. Um, because marketers, I don't know if anybody knows any marketers, but they see the world very differently. They're trying to get us to um, pay attention or, in many cases, buy something. And I think that we can learn an awful lot from that. And go, going back to what Anne was saying earlier, um, academics, particularly in the UK, there's a lot of emphasis on the words impact and outreach. Um, and social media seems like a very forward thinking uh, thing to put on a grant application. So when you have a project, for example, you say, oh, well, we'll have a blog or oh, we'll put it on Twitter. And I think a lot of money and time is wasted on these, um, particularly when people don't do a good job with them because they don't know how to follow through with that. So my goal with this project was to um, figure out some, to create some resources that would um, provide people with the skills to be able to do a good job of it. So instead of, instead of wasting the money, they can um, have something that's effective. Oh, there we go, we've got an animation. Right, so I use the word quacking a lot when I'm talking about social media. Um, and the reason for that is because um, I know we talk a lot about this idea of Web 2.0 or um, about getting people to engage with us in social media. But I think a lot of what we still see um, and what we saw in the, early days, in the early days of social media was people trying to make more noise than their neighbors um, because they were trying to get, they were trying to get heard over, over the quacking of everyone else. Um, and when we talk about social media, here's just a few icons. Uh, I don't even know what most of these icons do, actually. I don't know if these are still in business or not. These are various tools you can use for social media. Um, and so the important thing isn't to be an expert in all social media. It's to be um, aware of the ones that are going to work with your audience. So what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to talk about a few of these. Um, and in case anyone's not familiar, we have Facebook, Twitter, Blogger and WordPress, both of which are very common blogging platforms. Um, Flickr, which is photo sharing, and then a little bit on YouTube, because what I've actually done is created some YouTube videos. For the most part, I'm going to be talking about the middle four there. Um, and before I get into what I did with talking to the museum people, I thought what I would do is just give a little bit of background of where we were a few years ago. And this is a project, a research project I did in 2009 on an analysis of Twitter and Facebook use by the archival community. Um, and I think this is useful because what I discovered actually is that they were doing it fairly poorly. Um, and you'll be happy to know that the museum professionals that I talked to this past year have come incredibly far in terms of their effectiveness. So by giving the example here of what um, this archival community was doing a few years ago, um, I'm hoping I can start you a little bit farther along the line if you're trying to learn some of these skills. So what I did was I looked at um, institutions on Facebook, these are actual archives, professional archives, institutions on Twitter, and then anybody who self-identified as an archivist on Twitter. Obviously you can't do that on Facebook unless you're friends with them. Um, I'm not friends with a lot of archives, archivists. So I focused on these three groups and what I wanted to know was where are they trying to get us to focus our attention? So where are they pointing? Um, and social media, particularly Twitter, because there's a really um, a short character length, 140 characters, what a lot of people do is instead of say, trying to say something substantial, they'll say it substantially somewhere else and then they'll post a link to it and say you should go look at it, over, it's over here. Um, so what I did was I followed all these organizations and I, I clicked on all the links that they posted over, over a one month period um, to see what they wanted us to look at. And what I found was that they were, uh, the institutions and the archivists were completely different. So the institutions were posting links to their own websites almost exclusively, whereas the archivists were posting links to other people's websites, so websites that they didn't control themselves. And if you break down what the point of the link was, um, the institutions are 
basically quacking. They're, they're basically trying to get you to um, be aware of all the awesome things that they're doing that you should um, participate in. What are their services? When are their events? Things like that. And it was effectively uh, a press release system for them that used a different type of um, format. Whereas the archivists were uh, much more human in their approach. So they were posting links to blogs that they thought would be interest to the, interesting to their friends who were also archivists. Um, or they were posting pictures of what they had for breakfast or, or, or links to jokes and things like that. So it's much more of a human um, response which you would expect from an archivist as opposed to an institution. And in terms of the audience, um, it's pretty obvious that people want to talk to people. Um, they didn't want to read people's press releases. And there were a few exceptions um, here with the institutions. Some of the national institutions, for example, didn't have to do anything and they would have a huge following. Um, but for the most part, it was the archivists that people were interested in talking to. Another interesting thing that I came across was that uh, Facebook pages were incredibly inactive. And this was a couple years ago, but 54% of the pages hadn't been used or had been completely abandoned by the time that I came across them. Um, so they're just sitting there like, like burned out houses, really. Um, and it, it was an interesting discovery for me because it makes quite a statement about what these institutions thought about the value of Facebook um, for their needs. So the lessons I got from that project was basically don't be a robot. You, you don't want to just, um, you don't want to just try to promote everything that you're doing. You, ha you have to engage um, with other people and share what they're doing. Um, and make sure you're using an appropriate platform, which in this case, obviously, Facebook turned out not to be an appropriate platform for um, these organizations. So what I've done with this project is actually I've gone and I've talked to three different museums, um, and I, made, I did interviews with the people on the marketing team. Uh, I didn't actually intentionally go out looking for the people on the marketing team, but it turns out that those are the ones who are in control of the social media platforms. Um, and I did some videos, and I'm going to try to share one of those videos with you in a minute, which um, unfortunately, it's four minutes and I think 41 seconds, so you can just tune out the last 41 seconds of the rest of your video. Um, and I chose these institutions partly because they agreed to talk to me, but also because um, they represent different scopes in terms of the size of the organization, the number of resources that they could put towards a social media campaign. Um, they're all based in London. So we have the Foundling Museum, which is based in Bloomsbury. Um, it's a very small museum. The social media is run by one woman named uh, Gemma Colgan, and she does this as part of her job. So it's not her whole job. It's just something she does a few minutes a day. Um, so in my mind, this was the type of um, thing that you could expect perhaps a group of professors who are working collaboratively. They might want to have a social media platform uh, element to their project, but they don't have a huge amount of resources. They don't have a person that they can dedicate it to. So by taking a look at that small institution, you can get an idea of how they're dealing with those challenges. Um, the second group was the Courtauld Gallery, which is in uh, Somerset House, right next to King's College London, actually, um, which made it easy for me to get to. Um, and they are a academic institution. They have students who they teach, but they also have a world-class gallery, which um, focuses on impressionist paintings. So they are almost in between that academic and the heritage outreach community. Um, and they have a different perspective on how things go as well. So um, I thought that would be valuable. And then the last one is the National Maritime Museum, um, which is a massive nas national institution based in Greenwich, which is just in the east end of London. Um, and they had, I, I talked to three different people um, who works basically solely on marketing um, what they have to do. So this is something that I saw as this is where the high bar is um, and chances are most academics aren't going to be able to put that level of resources in. But I think it's interesting to see um, that spectrum. So for each of these I went and I talked to them about a particular uh, type of social media that they were using. Um, and the reason that I thought that museums in particular or the heritage sector in particular would be, would be useful for academics is because like academics, generally we're not trying to sell anything or they're not trying to sell anything. Um, they just want your attention. So I think that that is very similar to what we're trying to achieve within the academy um, and that makes them good people to, to turn to. So the first group here is the Foundling Museum. As I said, um, a modest size um, organization compared to a lot of the museums, um, and I talked to them about their Twitter account. Um, 
And this is something that they've been building up over several years. And um, the, the Gemma, who is in charge of it, um, really commented on the fact that there was a slow and organic process to adding followers to Twitter. Uh, and I think a lot of people think, oh, Twitter's a new thing. It's not really new anymore, but I think some people think Twitter's a new thing. Um, but if you have a time-limited project, for example, if you have a research project that's two years long and it's going to take you three years to get an audience where you're actually going to get that type of information out there, you might want to consider that when you're, tr when you're choosing your social media outlets. Um, there's just three things I wanted to cover with what I got from Gemma. Um, the first is the, the idea of consistency. The second is knowing the limits of your audience. And then the third is engaging with a dialogue. So by consistency, um, because Gemma's doing this on her own, this is obviously very easy. She's the only one doing the tweeting. But I'm sure you've all seen tweets from organizations where multiple people are chipping in. And that can create a very disjointed uh, experience for your users if they become used to receiving the information in a particular type of way, having different people um, jarring that experience can be unsettling. Gemma also thought it was important to have the idea of setting limits to what you're going to, how often you're going to use this platform. So she had a plan that she was going to do it once a day. Now you might decide once a week or once every two weeks or three times a day, but by having that decision and sticking to it, it allows you to integrate that into your overall work plan. Um, so you know, oh, it's 11 o'clock, I'm going to do my tweet, and then you go on to whatever you do at 11.05. Um, so if, if, if you don't have that plan, it becomes something that just, it's always lingering on your back and you feel like you should be doing it more, but if you just set that out, uh, you can avoid that feeling. The second thing is the limits of the audience, and the Family Museum also has a Facebook page, which is probably not that surprising. Um, but Gemma was surprised to discover, actually, that she wasn't getting the same audience on both um, both of these platforms. And the people on Facebook weren't necessarily interested in the same things as the people on Twitter, even though they were following the same organization. So she kept a notebook of what was working and what wasn't working on each of those platforms. And that had an advantage of if she decides to move on to another organization, then uh, the Founding Museum has a record of what's, what's been working and she can pass that on to them so they don't lose all of her knowledge. Um, and with that in mind, she also said just because you like a social media platform doesn't mean that your audience does. So if you're a Twitter user, it doesn't mean Twitter's the, the solution for you. I quite um, think Facebook is quite useless. Um, but if, if your audience is on Facebook, then you have to suck that up and you have to set up a Facebook page. And then the last thing, this goes back to what the archives weren't doing, which is you have to dialogue with people. Um, and join conversations. Make sure that you're responding to people who are um, communicating. Answer their questions. And if, they're promo if they um, tweet about something that's interesting, make sure you promote that, even that, if that doesn't directly um, promote yourself. The Courtauld Gallery um, was the second group, and they have a group blog, and I was interested in how are they doing this group blog. Their group blog is called Behind the Scenes, um, and you can find the address there on the bottom of the screen. And what they were looking to do was they were looking to get a different audience than that they would get coming through the door at the museum, so sorry, the gallery. So as you can imagine, their audience was typically over the age of 40, um, and the type of people who would seek out gallery, galleries and heritage organizations and come in on the weekend, they wanted to get younger people, and they also wanted a way for people who weren't in London to, um, to see what they were doing. And they decided to do a behind the scenes theme, which meant that they were showing people things about the gallery that they wouldn't get by coming in the door. So this was supplementing the experience that they had. So by having that um, niche idea, um, they were able to, to build an audience uh, in a way that's been quite successful for them. So I talked to two people here, actually. Um, there was a marketing manager and the curator of works on paper. And the thing that really came across from the marketing manager, a woman named Hannah Talbot, uh, was the importance of committed leadership when you're talking about a group blog. Um, and it was very clear from talking to Hannah that she was in charge of this blog, um, just to make sure that, that standards were enforced and that everybody stayed on task. So when you've got five people who say, oh yeah, I'll write a blog post, um, there's inevitably going to be that one guy who just never does do what he's going to say. Um, so it was Hannah's job to make sure that content was coming in, but also to make sure that the, the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed, and that everybody used um, the headers in the same way. Do you use capital letters? Do you use small letters? Um, because when you're dealing with a brand of an institution, whether you're a research group, an individual scholar, whatever it is, um, 
that consistency and professionalism, I think, goes a long way. And it was, it was her job to make sure that that was taken care of on behalf of the gallery. Social media integration was another thing. Um, obviously, having a blog is great, but not everybody's going to stumble across that. So she really emphasized the importance of integrating with Facebook and Twitter. So there's a tool, I think there's a lot of tools now, actually, that will do this. But there's one in particular that I've used called Twitter Feed, which every time you post a new post to your blog, you can have it automatically update these other social media tools as well. So that means you don't have to do three things, you just have to do one. And it's, it's, it's more ways for people to stumble across things. And then the last thing from uh, the Quartel Gallery was the idea that you really need to make sure you have sufficient resources to be able to pull this off. So to put it in perspective, this group blog, which I think publishes about once a week, um, takes a few hours per week for Hannah to manage. Um, and that's on top of the time that writers are putting into writing their individual posts. So it's, it's very easy to see social media as free, and I think that's why a lot of people are tempted to put that on their um, grant proposals to say, oh, we're going to have a Twitter feed. Um, but it's the human cost and the time that those humans have to put into it that's, that's really the expense here. The Cortel Gallery decided for their branding purposes that an abandoned blog was going to be worse than no blog at all. So they had discussions um, well before they committed to doing the project to make sure that this was something that they could commit to long term um, and make sure it remained vibrant. And the last organization was the National Maritime Museum and I talked to them about a particular project that they did with Flickr um, called Curate the Collection. Um, and I thought this was quite, quite a good project actually um, because it was done with the museum in collaboration with a Newcastle PhD student named Bronwyn Cole Cahoon um, and what they did was they had a series of um, images up on Flickr which they shared which which they shared freely and they asked 17 of their users to come together and pick 17 of the most striking images and I think I'm pretty sure this is one of those images that they chose and then they, they um, curated this into a physical exhibit within the museum itself. So they had this combined physical and social media element to the project, um, which I thought was pretty cool. And I'm actually, I'm going to try to show you this four minute, 41 second video. Um, so if you pay attention for the first four minutes, that would be great. My name's Emma McLean. I'm the Digital Marketing Officer here at Royal Museums Greenwich. I'm Lucinda Blazer. I'm a Digital Project Manager here at the National Maritime Museum. I've been dealing with Flickr since day one for museums. So I think it was about 2008. So we've been right on Flickr Commons from the start. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work around um, getting our historic photographs collections online which have um, very little information available about them so we thought well we'll get them up on Flickr and get the public helping us catalogue them and commenting on them you know improve our data quality. Flickr Commons had started We'd seen the Library of Congress go up there and the reaction that they had there to collect their collections. Um, Jane and I worked on putting together a proposal to go to the senior members of the museum to say that we want to do a community engagement project. We realised for many reasons that Flickr was a great platform for us to run a competition of this scale um, on because it can host a multitude of images and images that are available in a social capacity where you've got commenting, you've got favouriting, you've got sharing options that our website just simply didn't have the capacity to do. We analysed other platforms that use photography, um, so we knew we wanted something that has a community, um, something where people can communicate with each other, so we looked at lots of other platforms. We knew that it was a strong tool, we knew that they had robust systems in place, we knew they weren't going to lose the data. Um, so we knew it was a tool that could be trusted and something that had much more power than our own website would have to host those sorts of images. Uh, 
I think the key point for us that has changed the way we approach Flickr was the museum decided it wanted to be more conversational with its audience, but we've noticed that it's gone beyond that into the general specialist communities, the ship fanciers, the you know the cruising people, for which are we have a strong collection of those. You know, people who like lighthouses, and like boys who like ships. By having them on Flickr, it does make our images more searchable on yep. Google and such things like that. So people are stumbling across it more than they would if we had it on our own collection site, which is what we really want. It was about engaging with our Flickr audiences um, to curate a selection of images in the Compass Lounge, which is a space we use for co-curation projects within the museum. It's a public display, a very small display, um, and we wanted to get people who have been engaging with us online through Flickr to come and do a physical display in the gallery using images that they liked on Flickr our, of our collection. With these, we um, had word clouds, very much similar to the tag clouds that you have on Flickr because that's what the group chose and it was quite nice to map that over from something that happens online to something in the gallery um, and then link through to Flickr as well. In terms of working with Flickr, um, I found it quite difficult because their analytics that are built in are really, really limited. I have targets, usually quite numerical, to hit, whether it's visitor numbers or whether it's return on investment, in budget, in data capture, and whatever it might be. So we really decided to take a first step by putting a small number of historic photographs online uh, month by month probably around 20, and then seeing how people responded as a result. I don't think you need a big budget or anything like that for it, but I do think you need to consider kind of the, from the audience perspective how you can best um, kind of empower them to put that display on. It's really important to set out right from the beginning those criteria, those measures of success and what you see as success. So um, what I thought, I mean, that's just part of the interview that I had with them, but um, what I thought was really interesting about what they had done was that it was really quite unique. There was nothing about Flickr that necessarily um, facilitated the way that they decided to use it. And it can be risky to go off and use something in a way that people don't normally do it. But I think that's what made them stand out in this case. Um, the other thing that was really obvious was that it was incredibly well planned. I mean, they had to put this through the senior members of the museum, as they said. Um, so I think a lot of academics, particularly in the humanities, if you think of the idea of a book project, you, you create a book proposal and then you follow through that proposal. Um, whereas when you create a social media, um, you, you tick, I'm going to have a Twitter feed on, on your, your grant application. You don't put that same type of thought into it. And it's clear that within the museum world, um, they do put that type of thought into thought into it and they really think of it as a campaign and I think that's really a key word. The last thing there was the you have to have measures of success and I think that's really important because if you don't have something that you're trying to achieve um, it can feel like it's impossible to actually achieve that so whether you've got visitor numbers like the museum did or you want people to comment on your post or you want them to blog um, or you want them to buy you a beer because they thought it was great whatever it is um, by having those measures you can um, decide if it's wor working. Um, and I just wanted to end with this guy here because um, I want to emphasize that idea of going on campaign. Um, so it's a social media campaign. It's just it's not something that you can just throw together at the last minute. And uh, it's not something you actually have to do. Um, if there's one thing that I would urge you to consider when you're thinking of doing a social media campaign is that if it's not going to achieve what you want it to achieve, don't bother because it's a waste of money and it's a waste of time. So make sure what you do do is something you can actually take care of um, and it's something you can pull off. So that's it for me. Um, the last thing I have to do is get this into the hands of the types of people that can benefit from it. And I'm hoping that those are academics, both early career and the people who are um, putting in grant applications. So I have a series of the three videos with the three interviews as well as some write-ups. And I'd be happy to hear from anybody who thinks they are that right set of hands or knows where those hands are. So thank you very much. Thank you.